A few years ago, I did an audio visual program about the London Underground uh, as part of my lecture series. It's not on YouTube, by the way, but I thought it'd be a good idea to do a shorter program about the London Underground covering the way I approach the artistic and technical side of taking pictures in quite a difficult situation. Incidentally, when I'd finished the programme, I purchased for myself a little souvenir. In fact, I am sitting on it. And it is uh, this, which I thought was a bit of fun. Anyway, here comes the programme now. No one stopped me. I even asked staff for directions, not making it a secret of what I was doing. Nevertheless, it might be best to consult the TFL website first for the latest information. Assuming access to take pictures is not a problem, apart from common sense about where you can stand or go, the big photographic problem is lighting and people. Hand-holding the camera is mandatory and I don't burden myself by taking loads of unnecessary gear. Research first and then take only what is essential and just forget the rest. For the whole shoot, I use the Mark I version of the EM1 and the 12 to 50 lens. Nothing fancy or of a specialist nature and it worked beautifully. Saving to RAW is absolutely essential. The photographer is confronted with an enormous variety and range of artificial light, making getting it right on a shoot impossible. Although not essential, I used the cloudy preset for much of the time and then tweaked in Lightroom in the comfort of my home. More important is metering. And here, the electronic finder is invaluable because you can see what you are doing. I would spot meter and lock using S-AF, then recompose if necessary, erring on the side of underexposure and again correct in Lightroom. I had to work very quickly if a train was moving, but over time I gradually developed a technique where you could prejudge what would happen. Because of this, I did not wish to be in other people's way or accidentally find myself in a thoroughfare where passengers were rushing about. Broadly, I would find a viewpoint where my back was against the wall. At least that prevented me from being knocked over from behind and it also offered a bit of security. Interesting effects were possible with slow shutter speeds. Then I did not have the sophistication of the EM1 Mark II or that fabulous 12 to 100 Pro lens, which also has its own image stabilizer. Relying instead on the stabilizer in the Mark I version of the EM1. It produced excellent results at shutter speeds from a sixth of a second to a fifteenth, even without a second stabilizer in the 12 to 50 lens. But I am glad that chap didn't move. To assist sharpness in the image where required, I would stand four square, legs slightly apart, and hunched up, hold breath, click, and breathe out executed smoothly also helped. Not very high tech, is it? But it works when you cannot use a tripod. Also, I would stand near the tunnel with the train entering the station at speed, albeit slowing down, finding the effect better than standing at the 
other end of the platform with the train leaving. To maintain ultimate image quality, I kept the ISO at 200, increasing it to 400 only when necessary. The image stabilizer in the camera allowed me to take sharp images at around a tenth of a second. One of the hidden advantages of micro four thirds is extended depth of field, even at full aperture. Here, f3.5. If you are going to rely on image correction in post-production, don't do anything in camera that you cannot backtrack from. As has been mentioned already, setting white balance is okay, provided you save to RAW. I underexpose everything by a modest minus 0.3 EV, which can make a difference, but I don't increase the saturation in camera or any other control that is difficult to undo. Keep things simple and don't put yourself in a straight jacket because most things executed in Lightroom can be undone. For the AV lecture, I use the video facility on the EM1. The quality when using 4K is as good as stills when projected, permitting me to dissolve from a still to a moving image. As well as taking trains, some interesting effects were possible on escalators, especially where the architecture demanded it, such as at Canary Wharf. Whilst I allowed the exposure to sort itself out, because of low light there was a problem with autofocus. If a train was coming towards you, the focusing tended to keep searching with the image going in and out of focus. I found it best to focus manually at around, what, 50 feet, which covered most scenarios. Whilst some photographers are brave enough to take pictures of passengers on the train, it is something that I cannot encourage, although I did sneak a couple in. Getting caught could be extremely embarrassing, therefore I won't mention the technique, but you can probably guess. I did take some video shots through the window whilst travelling, but if you don't wish to have a self-portrait, position the camera as close as possible to the window, but not on it, as that will pick up unwanted vibrations of the train. At opposite ends of the architectural divide are Baker Street and Canary Wharf. One of the first stations to be built with the arrival of the Metropolitan Railway are the Circle Line platforms at Baker Street and faithfully preserved. Note the vents, originally used for smoke to escape from steam engines. Canary Wharf, of course, is more recent and future-proof, particularly as it will have to handle passengers using crossrail. It is of cathedral dimensions, which is something that can also be experienced at Westminster, particularly the escalator shaft. These holes are so large, it is a wonder that the whole of London doesn't suddenly disappear. For my own research, I found the little book of the London Underground by David Long, published by the history press, extremely helpful and entertaining. It includes some tantalising quiz questions. For example, which two adjacent stations can you do a return journey using northbound trains only? Answer in the book, and don't miss the chapter about items left on trains. However, don't read this chapter whilst travelling on the train, as other passengers will wonder why you have suddenly been reduced to fits of uncontrollable laughter. And by the way, don't forget either my online book, 50 Places to Visit from the London Underground. Just go to the Blurb website and put my name into their search engine and you will 
find it.